Okay. Give everybody a second to get in. Okay. Awesome. So let's start. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's webinar series. My name is Tara Shuchenko. I am the science writer and development coordinator at the Invasive Species Center, and I will be your moderator for today. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the Invasive Species Center is located on Robinson Huron Treaty territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe home of Garden River First Nation, Bachwana First Nation, and the Métis Nation. I would like to also acknowledge that the city of Ottawa, where I am located, is the unceded territory of the Algonquin Ash Anishinaabe peoples who have lived on this land for millennia. I'm just going to get to the next slide. There we go. To introduce our organization, the Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We've got lots of great invasive species resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and more. So check us out at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. So that's center, C-E-N-T-R-E. -E. You can also sign up on our homepage for our newsletter, bi-weekly media scan, and event invitations, which is where you can hear about upcoming webinars like this one. Before we get started on today's webinar, there are a couple things I would like to mention. So firstly, there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to type them in the question box and I will relay them to our presenters after the webinar. If you are having any technical difficulties at any time, please type them in the chat box or respond to the email found in your registration and we will try to resolve it for you. We have also enabled closed captioning. So if you would like to follow along that way, you can turn that on with the closed caption button uh, on your taskbar. Lastly, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar. If you could take some time to fill it out, we would really appreciate it. Thank you. Today's webinar is Extreme Cold Tolerance of the Emerald Ash Borer, Agrilis planipennis, and their invasion and control in Canada. I'm pleased to introduce to you our speakers, Megan Duell and Chris McCory. So Megan Duell. Uh, is a postdoctoral researcher based at Western whose research focuses on cold tolerance and physiological mechanisms of cold tolerance in insects, including emerald ash borers, spring field crickets, Arctic springtails, Arctic bumblebees, and others. Her research applies to pest management, climate change, and the impacts of environmental stressors. She has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania, where her research focused on pesticide toxicology in honeybees and plant pollinator interactions with native and invasive plants. She gained a master's and a PhD from Arizona State University in animal behavior, concentrated on the physiological mechanisms underlying behavioral performances among stingless bee species in the neotropics, including thermotolerance and flight physiology. She is currently located in Barrie and hopes to continue on to a career in conservation. She's also an avid hiker and gardener. So oh. Chris is a research scientist with Natural Resources Canada in Sault Ste. Marie. He has been in this position for 12 years, before which he was a technician, PhD student, and postdoctoral fellow with their laboratories in Fredericton and Edmonton. His area of research is on the risk and management of invasive species to Canada's forests. Most of his work is focused on emerald ash borer, but he has also worked on the hemlock woolly adelgid mountain pine beetle, spruce budworm, and birch leaf mining sawflies. His PhD is from the University of Alberta, and he has a Master of Science from the University of New Brunswick, and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Saskatchewan. This webinar will be in two parts. First, Megan will explain her research on emerald ash borer cold tolerance physiology, including lower lethal limits, supercooling point, and hemolymph cryoprotectant accumulation, glycerol, in larvae and pupae. 
She will compare populations that overwintered in London, Ontario, and Winnipeg during the 2019 polar vortex. Winnipeg emerald ash borers had extreme cold tolerance not previously measured with lethal temperatures around negative 50 degrees Celsius. She will also discuss whether this extreme cold tolerance is a seasonally acquired through phenotypic plasticity or whether it has evolved over the fairly short period of time the emerald ash borers have been in Canada. These data inform models that predict the possibility of future emerald ash borer invasions and establishment across Canada. Next, Chris will discuss the implication of Megan's cold tolerance findings as they relate to predicting the risk of EAB or emerald ash borer in urban and rural forests in Canada and the potential for their expansion into Western Canada. Thank you very much, Chris and Megan, for presenting today, and I will hand it off to you. Great, thanks, Tara. Um, I am going to actually turn my camera off since I've been having a, some connectivity issues this morning. So um, I'll do that quickly and share my presentation. Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here and talk about uh, overwintering emerald ash borers. Um, we recently published on this in Current Research in Insect Science, and I just want to point out um, a couple of people here that were um, that helped us do all this. So um, Meg Gray, this top picture here, uh, helped a lot with collection of ash bolts and sorting larva and pupa. Um, she's at Great Lakes Forestry Center. Amanda Rowe, who's also at Great Lakes Forestry Center, and Brent Sinclair. Uh, I did most of the physiology work in his lab at Western. Um, his lab focuses on uh, the overwintering biology of insects. I want to just quickly get my pointer. Okay. Oops. There we go. So uh, we're all aware that emerald ash borers, um, which I'll often refer to as EAB, are lethal pests to most, but not all ash species in Canada. And this is a pretty big problem because a significant portion of deciduous forest can be ash trees. Uh, in a lot of urban areas, ash can account for up to 70% of the tree cover. Um, so when an infestation starts, we can be looking at billions of dollars in damage and control measures. So an infestation generally starts towards the crown of the tree. You can see some defoliation and then the crown may begin to die off as the infestation moves further down the tree into the main trunk. And at this point, uh, you may see an increase in woodpecker activity or other bark deformities like splitting or missing bark uh, as the EAB tunnel through underneath the bark. Only trees at least several centimeters in diameter are susceptible because of the spatial requirements for the EAB as the larva grow. And the EAB life cycle begins with adults landing on an ash tree and laying eggs in the bark crevices. Uh, in an established infestation, this usually occurs around early to midsummer. But in a new infestation, the timing may not be as synchronized and can occur all summer long. So um, normally this life cycle takes one year, um, but sometimes it can take longer than that, going from uh, univoltine to semivoltine. Um, for size reference, I have here, this is an American penny um, with the adult beetle on there. So they're pretty small and hard to see uh, if you're not familiar with the look of them. Um, so then after the newly hatched larva enter the tree, they begin feeding and growing. They're gonna carve out these galleries that you typically see uh, under, under the bark and dead ash trees. Um, if they've grown enough over the summer and early fall, they'll overwinter as pre-pupa, which are notable because they contort into this characteristic J shape that we see here. Um, and that allows them to transition easily into the pupa pupation in the string, but it, in the spring, sorry, but it also allows us to easily identify them uh, as different from younger larva. The pre-pupa will eat a little bit deeper into the sapwood and make pupal chambers. And it's important to note that many AAB will overwinter as larva rather than pre-pupa, especially in colder areas where growth rates are generally a bit slower or in new infestations where egg laying is not as synchronized. 
so when spring rolls around, the larva will continue to grow and may um, overwinter that second year as prepupa. But the prepupa that just overwintered will pupate and emerge as adults in the early spring, and the cycle continues. The adults tend to not travel very far on their own. They're pretty small. Um, they may get several kilometers at most flying. Um, they're small, not particularly good flyers. So a lot of the movement of emerald ash borer we see is human caused. Um, EAB were introduced into Canada around 2000 and officially recognized in 2002. They entered through the US around the Detroit Windsor area and moved eastward and northward, um, killing a huge proportion of the susceptible ash trees within about a decade. Um, we're pretty certain that all the EAB in Canada um, came from this common introduction event. Um, the kill rate is about at least 90%, um, and they continue to move, like I said, mostly because of people moving items like firewood. And this map um, shows the extent of susceptible ash trees. Uh, with winter temperatures overlaid, um, models 99% mortality of emerald ash borers um, based on some data collected in pre-pupa around 2009 that I'll show in a little bit. So the purple line um, that you see shows where emerald ash borers will be able to establish based on those data and outside of that the condition, overwintering conditions are um, not acceptable based on those data for them to establish and uh, have long-term infestations. Um, but those data showed that temperatures of negative 35 degrees Celsius would kill 99% of the emerald ash borers, meaning that um, you know, there's a low probability outside of that zone if it gets lower than negative 35 in the winter. So keep this temperature in this map in mind because um, Chris and I will both come back and touch on this later. Um, zooming in on several specific susceptible ash species, uh, there are lots outside of that zone of survivability for EAB based on those older data. This isn't all the ash cultivars in Canada, and, and I know that Chris is going to talk about it, at least one case um, of a different species out west. Lots of ash populations might never see a EAB establishment if those older data hold true, which would be really great news for us in controlling them. I'm gonna focus on more recent physiology data that tells us some bad news, unfortunately, uh, that 99% mortality does not happen at negative 35 degrees, but may require much lower temperatures. So we compared uh, EAB from Southwest Ontario that overwintered in the London area to those overwintered in Winnipeg. Um, so EAB was introduced in London around 2006 and all susceptible ash was wiped out. Winter is mild in London with average temperatures between negative five and five degrees Celsius, well above that negative 35 degree limit. Uh, EAB were only recently confirmed And it's also more common in Winnipeg to have extreme cold events that get closer to that negative 35 degrees. The coldest temperature we measured in um, winter in 2019 during the polar vortex was negative 36.8. Um, but in London, we only um, had temperatures as low as negative 24. So this gives us a good opportunity to figure out whether emerald ash borer have become more cold tolerant as they're moving westward and northward to potentially colder places. So um, getting to that data that I mentioned here, um, these are physiology data collected in the winter 2009-2010 that um, shows that EAB avoid freezing. They all die if they freeze, that we term this freeze avoidance. Uh, the typical supercooling point, the temperature at which the body initiates freezing of pre-pupa was only uh, negative 27 degrees on average. Uh, there wasn't any real data at the time on larva. Um, again, 99% of mortality um, once temperatures got down to negative 35. And we can see in this figure um, from Crossweight et al. at the time that super cooling points are lowest at the coldest time in winter. You can see in January and February, as you might expect. And um, that's possible because emerald ash borers accumulate a huge amount of glycerol 
in their hemolymph, um, their blood, uh, through seasonal acclimation processes in the fall as temperatures get lower. So this glycerol um, tracks basically when they're most cold tolerant. They have more glycerol stores in the winter when it's coldest, when they need it to avoid freezing. Um, they may also accumulate some other um, low molecular weight cryoprotectants, protectants, um, but those haven't been measured in any real quantities in emerald ash borers. So um, we should note here that emerald ash borers have really high glycerol concentrations on the order of molar rather than milli or micromolar as most hemolymph solutes tend to be an in insect. So in a non-cold tolerant insect, you're looking at maybe 400 millimolar uh, as the total hemolymph concentration of all solutes where glycerol can get up to three or four molar in these emerald ash borers. Now, based on these data, the 2019 polar vortex should have been lethal and killed off all the EAB in London and Winnipeg uh, if those previously collected data still hold. At the time, there was a lot of press about this and uh, hope that that would indeed be the case. So um, here we have this figure which tracks temperatures in um, London and in Winnipeg. So from here on out, Winnipeg data will be shown in bluish tones and uh, London data will be shown in reddish tones. And I'll um, keep a legend on each slide that has data too, just in case there's any colorblind issues and we can't tell what um, each color means. So the polar vortex is outlined here in this lighter blue area and the arrow indicates when we did the sampling. So you can see that Winnipeg is about 10 degrees cooler on average throughout the whole winter than in London. Um, so what we did to measure cold tolerance in the ash borers um, was first we took the, uh, some from southwestern Ontario. These were collected in Barry because as I said, all the ash were killed off years ago in London. We couldn't get any there. So we took them from Barry. We overwintered them in London and we took some from Winnipeg um, from the new infestation that overwintered there in Winnipeg. And we did several things. So first we froze individuals that measured their super cooling points as a baseline um, for when they freeze to determine cold tolerance. And lower super cooling points means more cold tolerant. We also measured uh, mortality at a range of temperatures and oops. And then um, I could extract hemolymph and measure the overall osmolality or the, the concentration of um, solutes in the hemolymph using osmometry. And uh, this is a method that allows us to measure very precisely when hemolymph freezes, and then we can back calculate the, the total concentration from there. So, uh, and then finally, um, knowing already that glycerol accumulates in huge quantities in the EAB, uh, I measured glycerol with a colorimetric assay with a spectrophotometer. And I won't go into too much more detail about the methods, but if you have questions, um, please do let me know. So we also measured temperatures in the locations where the EAB overwintered using either HOBO recording devices or um, publicly available data from Environment Canada. So again, red is London and blue is Winnipeg. Um, this is the, the same I showed before for 2018, 2019, and the polar vortex is outlined. So these data show the differences in supercooling points among larva and prepupa in both locations during that winter. So supercooling points um, held steady in about the same range as the 2009 data in London, um, but there's a much broader range in, in Winnipeg um, for both larva and prepupa. And you can see that the Winnipeg population overall is uh, has lower supercooling points. They're, they're more cold tolerant, so they'll freeze at lower temperatures than the London population. Um, some of the lowest supercooling points we measured were around negative 50 degrees Celsius. Um, that's extremely cold. It doesn't really get that cold in many areas where ash trees actually grow. Um, the lowest was negative 52. So um, something you'll notice is that 
there's a bigger distribution of supercooling points in the Winnipeg population, and um, that could be contributed to the age and weight range. Um, compared to the London population, we had a lot more variable ages and, and masses. Um, so the smaller individuals may not have been able to acquire as much cold tolerance through acclimation or as much glycerol during that time period as the, the older individual larva or the, the pre-pupa, which would have been older. Um, so we didn't observe 90% mortality in the Winnipeg population. Uh, until around negative 45 degrees Celsius. Um, whereas the London population again was consistent with those 2009 data. And this is important because it's gonna take a certain proportion of the population surviving um, to emergence in the spring in order to establish the population and cause damage. So if you still have about 10% survival at negative 45 degrees, there aren't a whole lot of places that are out of reach for EAB establishment. Now. We don't know exactly how many individuals are needed, what proportion of a population needs to survive winter to fuel that um, establishment process. Um, but the more that survive these super cold temperatures, the easier it's gonna be for them to establish and cause damage. So um, we also found differences in the overall hemolymph solute concentrations. Um, both Winnipeg larva and prepupa had much higher concentrations or osmolality than the London population. So here in these data, we can see um, each of the, the triangles for Winnipeg or the um, dots for the London population are individuals and a lot of them are, are overlaying each other. Um, so you can see that larva and prepupa in general in London have much higher osmolality around three osmolar, um, whereas in Winnipeg, it's, it's up near around four, four and a half molar. So when we talk specifically about glycerol, you can see that a lot of that overall concentration is explained by glycerol, but not absolutely all of it. So um, later in winter, we found that there was a lower uh, amount of water. So they became a little bit dehydrated. And as I said, there could be other low molecular weight cryo cryoprotectants in the hemolymph, um, maybe something like proline. Um, but those were not measured. And uh, a lot of this cold tolerance can be explained by the glycerol anyway. So um, interestingly, oops. Interestingly, um, working with this hemolymph was a little bit like pipetting jello. It was really, really viscous, um, difficult to work with. So you can, you can see just in handling this stuff that it's gonna be harder to freeze it. Um, so next we wanted to know if this big increase in cold tolerance in the Winnipeg population was all down to plasticity, that seasonally acquired cold tolerance gained through acclimation in the autumn, or if uh, some of this might be explained by evolutionary processes like selection. So EAB has been in Canada for 20 years now around 20 generations for selection to act on, if that were the case. And we don't know the exact location of the source population for the Winnipeg infestation. Um, but we, again, we surmise that they came from the same original introduction event. Um, it's possible that the individuals that first arrived in Winnipeg were from somewhere that was already cold and they had undergone a little bit of selection as, as opposed to those uh, further south in Ontario. So um, what we did was a translocation of sorts. Um, COVID didn't allow us to run this the way we wanted. Um, we were only able to get our hands on Winnipeg amber lash borers. So we split the wood bolts um, in half and overwintered half of them in a simulated Winnipeg conditions and half of them in uh, London conditions. Uh, and then we um, extracted the emerald ash borers, we measured supercooling points, um, assessed mortality and hemolymph uh, concentrations. Again, we're using the same methods we used before. So this temperature trace from um, 2020, 2021 looks a little bit different than the 2018, 2019 
temperature trace. Um, so all these individuals originated in Winnipeg. So you see the blue trace um, goes as far as they were still present in Winnipeg. And then they were shipped to us in London. Half of them then experienced outside London temperatures, the red trace, whereas the other half were put into a walk-in incubator. So that's the, the gray trace at the bottom. So uh, I was able to program that walk-in incubator so the temperatures oscillated over 24 hours between the average highs and average lows uh, for Winnipeg for that time of year. <clears throat> so um, super cooling points for the London overwintered EAB this time around um, are similar to the original London EAB from 2018-2019, um, but we see some differences in the EAB that overwintered in the simulated Winnipeg conditions um, compared to those um, from 2018-2019. They're a bit less cold tolerant in this case. And uh, pre-pupa come in here around um, negative 40 rather than negative 50 in super cooling points. Um, and these data don't directly allow us to conclude whether it's acclimation or evolutionary processes behind this. So we need to, to look a little bit further into the rest of the data before we draw any conclusions. Um, again, overall hemolymph osmolality was higher in the population that um, experienced simulated Winnipeg versus uh, London conditions, but not by as much as we saw previously. Um, in fact, the London overwintered prepupa have higher osmolality than the 2018-2019 London EAB. And we do see that most of the high osmolality, again, is accounted for by glycerol. Larva and prepupa here are varying um, between the London population, but not as much in the Winnipeg population. Um, we just we can see this bigger range going on here. So um, comparing these data, so just first to point out um, the the bottom 2018-2019 data. Um, they're showing bar graphs and all the individuals there. We had fewer individuals to work with because I had to split the, the population um, from Winnipeg into two groups. So we just don't have as many individuals in the top, which is why the, the figures look a little bit different. So when we compare, um, we have some, some differences here. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can note again that those um, that overwintered in simulated Winnipeg conditions are a bit more cold tolerant, but not quite as much as the original um, 2018 population. Um, so we wouldn't really expect that to happen if selection was the primary process acting here. You would expect that um, cold tolerance to be a little more steady and the switch. Um, in conditions during that late acclimation period um, when they were shipped to us to London conditions uh, wouldn't affect them quite as much. So uh, furthermore, um, 20 years is a fairly fast time frame for evolutionary processes. It's not unheard of among insects, um, but it would be fairly unusual. There are some examples. So uh, it took around 30 years for Aedes albopictus, a mosquito um, to evolve diapause, which is uh, a time period of quiescence um, or state of dormancy, whereas before they didn't have it. Uh, and we also know that local adaptation of invasive species can tend to evolve rapidly uh, in other invasive species. Um, but we would expect a few more decades in general, um, more generations for that to act on. Um, and that's not to say that no evolution is occurring, but uh, we don't really see the signatures of it here in our data. And um, based on our findings, the seasonal acclimation is definitely sufficient to induce extreme cold tolerance. Um, we should note that in 2018, 2019, right before we measured them, they went through the polar vortex, right? So um, in some cases, insects will go through what we call rapid cold hardening, where they have they're exposed to a low temperature and then they're more cold tolerant 
afterward than they, they otherwise would be. Um, and we also compared genetic barcodes of individuals in both locations, both to confirm species because there are other ash borers present in Canada, um, but also just to, to check um, whether there were differences. So uh, the genetic barcodes were, were very similar between the two locations. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily expect that if there was a lot of genetic divergence between the two. Um, so based on our data, we think that a lot of this is seasonal plasticity. That's bad because it only takes one season to acquire seasonal plasticity. Uh, the acclimation you know, processes can result in extreme cold tolerance in a short period of time. Each generation can go through that in different ways, depending on the, the season. Um, but it doesn't require selection, which would be a slower process to gain that, that super extreme cold tolerance. Um, so there are a bunch of other things that we can do to, to thresh this out a little bit more. And one of those things is developing better models for um, tree pest survival in general. So we could take these physiology data and plug them into invasion models and use local weather and climate data to predict establishment based on winter weather conditions. Um, and we, that's ongoing. And we can also monitor temperatures inside the trees just to see if the tree has buffering capacity and maybe it's a little bit warmer in the trees than, than we think it is, that, that is possible. Um, that's also ongoing. Um, so we can run similar cold tolerance experiments on parasitoids, which, which can be used as biocontrol, um, especially certain species of uh, Tetrasticus parasitoid wasp. Um, which may be useful. And if we understand their cold tolerance and how they overwinter, we can you know, develop better ways of using them essentially as biocontrol. Um, and this one's more for plant physiologists or botanists, but we uh, might also be able to measure whether the seedlings that are now popping back up in the ash seed bank from previously infested areas have any sort of resistance to EAB. And I hope that eventually all these things will, will help us figure out how to track and control it better. Um, but now I want to hand it over to Chris for more about spread and control. Thanks, Megan. Hi, folks. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, I'll get my video off just uh, to save my bandwidth and everybody else's. So uh, Megan did a really great job of um, sort of talking about what we found in Winnipeg and and, and the, the big finding there is those bugs were, um, could obviously take a lot more cold than we had expected based on uh, to the previous data that, that, that the Brent Slab, had, Brent Sinclair's lab had collected there in London at the start of EAB infestation. So the, 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 the next question sort of co comes from that is what, what's the implications of that for, um, for EAB in Canada and certainly EAB in Western Canada? What kind of predictions does that, how does that change our predictions of what the risk is to that part of, uh, of Canada and, and the ash resource there? So um, if I can get my slides change. There we go. So what we're gonna do is just briefly jump back and look at what those previous models predicted based on that original data from London um, from, from the early 2000s. And this is work, by, this is Kim Cuttington's work at University of Waterloo. And Megan uh, showed one of the, the models, uh, one of the outputs of one of those models at the start of her talk. And I'm just gonna revisit that briefly. So just to revisit what um, uh, Stephanie Sobeck and, and Jill Crosswaite showed is that you had 99% mortality of prepupa at minus 35.4 degrees Celsius. So gets that cold, you know, a, a good chunk of those prepupa emerald ash borer die in the tree. At about 30 degrees, minus 30 degrees Celsius, you get 75% mortality of prepupa. And those are um, sort of pre-climate change. Those are winter conditions you might normally expect to, to experience, in, certainly in Western Canada, um, fairly frequently, maybe not every winter, but, but certainly quite frequently. I, gr I grew up in Saskatoon and I remember um, certainly those are temperatures that we would dress up for and go out you know, on school days. So it, it gets that cold and certainly in Western Canada. So um, what, uh, 
what um, Kim was able to do is, is to use that, um, use those probabilities of mortality and, and look at how often those kind of cold mort mortality events would be expected to occur. And so you get a map like this, and this is just based on air temperature. Um, so it's experienced air temperature in, the, in certain parts of Canada. How frequently does that happen? And what, the, what that map shows is that um, in, in the places where it, this map is green, it, it occurs fairly frequently. So, you know, every one or, or two years. So you're talking about, you know, parts of Alaska, you know, far northern Canada, well outside of where ash normally grows. Um, and, and what the blue tones show is the, the sort of where the, the average winter minimums under, under sort of previous climate normals. Um, and the, the purple is the range of ash in North America, but um, in parts of uh, Western Canada, we've also planted lots of ash. So Edmonton, Calgary, um, Prince George, Interior BC, and then in, certainly in Saskatoon and Regina, I have lots of planted ash. So these are cities with significant ash component. Um, so what, that, what this says is that those, those cold mortality events are fairly infrequent in Eastern Canada and, and the US but more frequent in, in, uh, in Western Canada. If you look at the 75% mortality events, um, they happen um, quite a bit more frequently, um, certainly in Western Canada, um, but not anywhere near as often in, in the Eastern part of North America. So you get those cold events, you know, um, in Northern Ontario, um, all, most of, you know, most of Manitoba, Southern Manitoba, Southern Saskatchewan, Southern Alberta, um, Alberta, South of, of Edmonton, of course. Um, but not that often in, in Eastern Canada, which kind of jives with um, how Emerald Ash Borer has progressed. Um, the, the populations have moved, you know, started in Windsor, as Megan said, and has spread up into the Maritimes over the past about 20 years and without much impact of cold. And so what um, Kim's models predicted is that based on those, those early assessments of, of ash, Emerald Ash Borer mortality is that um, there's the reality of, of, of how of emerald ash borer survival in Western Canada is somewhere between these two predictions. Um, so there's perhaps a sweet spot where a, EAB might be able to be introduced into, into Western Canada. So somebody bringing firewood from, you know, parts of the U.S. or or, or, or Ontario into Western Canada and the emerald ash borer escaping, starting a population, but that population getting knocked back fairly regularly by these frequent cold events. And what that means is that there might be parts of Western Canada that would be sort of an ash refugia in parts of Western Canada. And this is sort of similar to what we've seen in parts of Western Canada with, with um, Dutch elm disease, where the population is slowed down and you still have elm in, in certain parts of, of Western Canada. Um, but that's based on those previous predictions. If we now look at Megan's new results, right, suggesting that emerald ash borer, pupupa and larva can survive much colder temperatures. It suggests that those, those, those not, that the, a prediction map for what the probability of, of emerald ash borer mortality occurring in Western Canada looks a lot like that 99% mortality map. So those cold events, those minus 40, minus 50 events happen infrequently, if, if at all, in Western Canada, and certainly in, in most of, you know, um, except for the far north parts of, of North America. So those, those cold mortality events are extremely rare. And what that means is that emerald ash borer can likely survive winter in most of Western Canada, and certainly most of Western Canada where ash can grow. So within the range of where ash is planted and where it grows naturally, the emerald ash borer can survive based on what Megan has shown with her cold tolerance data. But the context though is, is important. Um, because, uh, and, and there's some things that we need to sort of caveats on, on that finding. And, and the, because the, the previous models are based on pre-pupa. So the survival of that one stage going through the winter. Um, we also know that they, it's also based on uh, our, our, our predictions of survival and predictions of, of how the emerald ash borer behaves are based on what goes on in, East, in Eastern North America and Eastern Canada, where the ash component is different. It's dominated certainly in the urban forest by green ash and white ash. We know the ash component is different in Western in Canada. And finally, we, we, make, we make predictions about the impact of climate change, but that most of those impacts have looked at what the effect of it is on warming. Basically, you know, winters not being as warm as they were in the past. And what does that do for the, the survival of the insect and, and insects in general? And what the reality is, is different. So we know that the overwintering stage in Canada is uh, of the emerald ash borer is highly variable. So this, this is some data that we took from different parts of Canada at different times of the emerald ash borer infestation. And what and it's basically anything in brown um, shows the insect shows the population of the insects going through in uh, an, 
uh, for a second, first or second or third instar. And what that means is that insect will take two years to develop. So it's overwintering as a larva. And what Megan showed is that the overwintering cold tolerance of larva was, um, was still pretty cold, but it was less than it was a pre-pupa. So um, predicting cold tolerance, uh, or predicting the survival of a population in, in a place depends on knowing um, what proportion of the population is in each stage as they enter winter, because that will affect how much survival you're going to get and how long that, how fast that population is going to take to grow. The second thing we know is that the, the ash component in Western Canada is, 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 not, is not the same as it is in, in Eastern Canada. Um, and one example is Mancana ash, is, so, which is the Manchurian ash cultivar, and that's the, the native host of emerald ash borer in the native range in Asia. It's, it's common in Western Canada, it's certainly in the urban forest, and it's resistant to emerald, to emerald ash borer. And so this is some data from a, a paper in 2008 by Rebeck. Um, that looked at percent mortality of ash in different cultivars. And, and I've just highlighted the, the percent mortality of, of, um, of, Ma of Mancana ash in these common garden experiments compared to the other uh, susceptible cultivars and susceptible species of, of ash. So having a resistant cultivar, having a non-susceptible cultivar growing in the urban forest changes the dynamics of the population. And finally, um, what we know about climate change is that will impact the, the, the temperatures we experience, but it also will change global circulation patterns. So you get what pattern that um, Catherine Cahoe has called, has called global weirding, where you get more, um, more frequent unpre and unpredictable events like our polar vortices. So this is a map um, showing emerald ash borer survival or predicted mortality from the 2019 polar vortex. So the kind of the, the event that kicked off all of that. And so that was a massive polar vortex event that dropped cold temperatures in far down into North America. And we looked at predictive mortality based on the old models. Um, and you, we would have seen very high mortality all through Saskatchewan, all through Manitoba and down and in, even into Minnesota and Wisconsin. So those events can um, change the, the annual predictions of what, um, of what the in of what a population might experience in a year. So in the long run, we might expect emerald ash borer to be able to establish and survive. But the if these events happen, these polar vortices events or other similar events happen more frequently, um, it can you know in a year knock down a population to the point that they will have to bounce back. So all that changes and all that affects our predictions of how well emerald ash borer might do is sort of in the in the parts of Canada where it has yet to to um, to establish. So the take home from this, and, I, and I've stolen uh, a, a little uh, picture here from our friends in Manitoba who were a big help um, in, with this work and sending us logs and finding us trees in Winnipeg to, uh, to, to sample for this, for, for Megan's work. But what these new data suggest um, is that there's a much higher probability that Emerald Ashbrook can survive winter in Western Canada and west of Winnipeg where it's well established. And the, the, the probability of that long-term establishment is affected by weather, affected by climate, and it's also affected by the host. So there's a bunch of things that are going to caveat how well it's going to do in Eastern Canada and Western Canada. And that's all areas of active research and things that we need to be looking at. And finally, the, the cold will likely not keep the remaining Western provinces EAB free. So what's important is to sort of maintain that vigilance and survey and detection um, as key to mitigating the, the insect. So if you if you know you have it, there's things you can do right away to, to start to manage it and start to prevent those populations from growing. So I'm going to end there. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. And I think... Um, uh, I think now we'll do questions, and I think um, either Lauren or Tara is going to handle that. Yeah, yeah, I'll handle the, the Q&A. Cool. Um, I don't see anything in the chat box yet. I'll look in the chat too. No, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll discuss them here. Um, I do have a few questions uh, myself. Uh, so one is for... Um, both of you. So um, given your knowledge of other invasive insects, do you think that this is something that we could possibly see in, like this level of cold tolerance is something we could possibly see in other species? Um, I guess I'll go first. I think that really depends on the source of the insects and what the original populations um, have the, the genetic um, plasticity to, to, to do, right? So emerald ash borers from places in Asia where it gets pretty cold. So we know that they have some sort of baseline for doing that. And we know that they have a mechanism for accumulating a huge amount of cryoprotectants in order to do it. So if an insect had that sort of genetic background, had the ability to um, you know, have a mechanism to acquire more cold tolerance, either seasonally or through really fast evolutionary processes, then 
then sure we could see that. I mm, think what you. You know, what Megan's data showed showed is that um, when when a new invasive insect is found, we tend to assume that you know we'll we'll see what it's how it behaves in one place, and we'll apply that broadly across the range. Um, what Megan's shown is that we need to maybe re repeat these assessments when we find it in a new place to see if exactly what she found is going on. Because previously we would have, we would have predicted that it shouldn't survive in Winnipeg and it shouldn't it shouldn't persist there, but Megan's explained why it can. That's great. Awesome. Uh, so we, we have a question in the chat now um, from Erica. So is asking, can you review how to locate them to know if they are on your property or park? I think this one's more for you, Chris. Um, so, uh, it, when you're surveying for them, the, the classic signs are looking for the D-shaped exit holes, uh, and that's all through the, the uh, you know, in the bark. Um, you can look for uh, epicormic shoots. You can look for branch dieback. Um, you can look in the wintertime and in the, before the leaves are on the trees, you can look for evidence of woodpecker feeding. That's usually a very good sign that, that they're there. The woodpeckers are very good at finding them. Um, and you can look for sloughing bark. You can sort of peel back the bark a little bit and look for the galleries. Those are, those are the sort of the classic signs and symptoms of, of EAB. Often though, when you find galleries lower on the tree, it's a bit too late for your trees. Yep. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the unfortunate part. If, you, if, you, if they're at eye level, um, your, your options for mitigation are, are, are rapidly diminished, so. Okay. Okay, and also um, another question, you mentioned that there are uh, cultivars that might be resistant to emerald ash borer. Do you know anything about how those might, I guess, um, replace other ash tree species? Would they be a good replacement for them? So there are um, there are some breeding programs that are going on in the U.S. that are looking that have taken um, uh, um, ash that have survived. So these lingering ash trees that are in places where the the ash, emerald ash borer has gone through and killed ninety nine percent of the trees, and they've used those those trees to as um, breeding stock to establish resistant cultivars. And as I understand it, those are sort of in the um, the, the stage where they're starting to plant them out and look at what's their sort of susceptibility in, in common gardens and in fields to attack by EAB. And if that's successful, then the next stage would be using those to, to plant ash back in new places where it has been extirpated by the, by the beetle. Cool. Okay, so we have a, we have a few questions in the, the question and answer now. So what, the first question is, um, have you, has there been any notable increase in woodpecker populations? Um, for example, if they're acting as extra food for the woodpeckers? That's a great question. Um, I don't know that anyone has analyzed that. Um, I can I think there's one study. Yeah, I think there's one study that's looked at that woodpecker populations and their and the, and the increase and I can't remember I can't remember the author or what or, or what they found but there's one that has looked at that. Um, you get you certainly do see woodpeckers uh, like when they're attacking them and um, the the dynamics are different depending on whether you're in urban for in urban forests or in sort of natural forests because woodpeckers also need um, like they need cavity trees to, to nest in. And so in urban centers, those can sometimes get taken out. And so there's, there's a reduced population of trees for the woodpeckers to take advantage of, but they certainly seem to have an impact in the, in sort of natural forests. So I'm getting a few more questions here. So another question is, um, is there a similar pattern of single tree infestation? For example, with high snow volumes this year, I can imagine any larvae that were insulated by the snow would survive over the ones in higher branches. So I guess asking the difference in survival between locations on the tree. Yeah, so that's sort of in the works. Um, we have temperature monitoring going on in, inside trees. So in the sapwood and, and under the bark and the gallery areas. Um, snow does buffer temperature, but uh, we have to keep in mind that they're already inside the tree, which is a, an area that's already sheltered from wind and um, it may 
buffer them by a degree or two, um, but it's not going to be very much, right? Because um, trees don't maintain any sort of temperature that's that's very much different from the outside environment. So um, we don't know that for for sure, but um, it, it's unlikely that the snow makes a huge difference in that. Um, so another question in the chat. Um, you mentioned um, parasitoid tolerance research. Have any been released in Winnipeg? Um, and is there any baseline data on survivability? Um, not in Winnipeg. Chris, where have you guys released? The furthest, uh, actually the furthest east, sorry, the furthest west site is actually here at Sault Ste. Marie. Um, the, at least in Canada, there's some west, there's some releases been in, done in, in uh, Minnesota. Um, we haven't released in Winnipeg because the population hasn't grown to the point where we think it'd be able to survive, to, to, to sustain uh, a release of the parasitoids. There's very specific conditions of sort of woodlots and number of infested trees and stage of the infestation that we need to release there. It just hasn't got to that point in Winnipeg yet. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question is, are there any other insects that make similar galleries to EAB that the might be confused with emerald ash borer? Yes. Um, so one example is the red-headed ash borer. Uh, that's present in a lot of places in Canada and is a native. Um, it doesn't cause quite as much damage because a lot of the trees have some resistance to it since it's a native. Okay. So, um, so another question is, did your research look into mountain pine beetles in Western Canada, or have you looked into mountain pine beetles in Western Canada, and how um, climate change can affect them, or have you heard anything about that? Uh, I, I did not work on cold tolerance of mountain pine beetle. There's a, there's a, a fairly decent um, literature on uh, cold tolerance of mountain pine beetle. Uh, Kathy Bleicher has worked on it. And then there's a, a new project, um, uh, and, and Dezine Huber as well. There's, there's another project. There's a project being funded out of the Nutria grant with Heath McMillan and Catherine Cullingham at Carleton. Carlton. Carlton. Um, that looking at uh, cold tolerance of mountain pine beetle in the expanding range. So, you know, a couple of years until you'd see more on that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question is so you mentioned that the research is focused on the pre pupae stage. Um, is there any evidence that cold tolerance might differ among other developmental stages? So, I know you looked at the other two stages. Um, so and I saw you looked at two different stages. Is there any other differences between developmental stages? So um, we haven't looked at the eggs and we haven't looked at adults because they really only exist during the warmer months. Um, there's no reason to think they would really have cold tolerance at that life stage um, because they're, they're not alive during the winter. So um, the larva and the prepupa are the stages that overwinter. Uh, and in these data, we looked at both of those. Um, it seems like the pre-pupa and the larva can be just as cold tolerant in established populations. Um, so that's a big deal because um, previously we really didn't know anything about the larva, but that allows a lot more individuals to get through the winter. Um, so in, in the new populations, um, I think I showed in, in Winnipeg during 2018, 2019, there was a bit more variation among the larva than among the pre-pupa. Uh, and that's probably an age and, and mass related thing, um, depending on the age and the instar, they may not have had quite as much time to acquire all the glycerol and the seasonal acclimation cues necessary to be quite as cold tolerant in that case. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, there's another question in the uh, question box. So what is the minimum, I'm not sure what this is, DIA. Diameter. Diameter. Oh, there we go. Thank you. For the EAB to propagate and survive. Um, you know, in, in the lab, we can get them to grow in as things as small as five centimeters. Uh, you can certainly see that in the field. Um, you know, so anything a bit bigger than your thumb, they're probably able to, to establish it. So. Okay. Awesome. We have some more information in the chat, it looks like, on the 
EAB and Woodpeckers. Uh, and we have some thank yous for your presentation and the information. It looks like Erica has quoted the study that I was trying to remember about um, effects on birds. So thank you, yes. Erica. At the stage where I've read papers and I'm like, I, I know I read that somewhere, but I don't know who wrote it or where it was published. <laughs> yeah, I really should read more about birds, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting interaction. It's a good question. I, my, my, my thing is telling me there's, there's hands up. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, so if you, if you have any questions, just type them into the, either the chat box or the question box. Unfortunately, we're not able to um, answer any questions through audio. Looks oh, like there's, there's another one in the yeah. Q&A. So this is from a management point of view. They're asking, what if we remove trees when they reach two to four centimeters? Would that be? Um, that's not a management tactic I'm, I'm, I've heard of. Uh, when you, things that small are, so the, the, the larger question of what is the, what are the population dynamics of Emerald Ash will look like in post-invasion sites? It is sort of that answers that question about what's happening in little trees. And that's one of the things we don't know super well, because certainly at least in Canada, we're kind of just at that end of that infestation point. So we know that when the trees get above to, you know, above two to five centimeters, they're able to be attacked. So if you go to places that where emerald ash borer has killed most of the trees and the little trees get that big, the emerald ash borers seem to, to, to find them. What we don't know is how much they get attacked and what are the influences of the introduced biological control agents, the other predators that have controlled the populations and, and how well are those little trees able to defend themselves. So it's a question, it's a research question that we don't have a good answer to yet. Um, if those trees are able to defend themselves because they're slightly resistant or because other things are eating the emerald ash borer, then they should be able to grow. So there's no reason to, to cut them down. It's, it's, it's fine just to let them grow up and, and sort of see what happens. I mean, anecdotally, I have a little ash tree in my backyard that's like about five feet tall. EB went through my neighborhood about like four years ago and killed a couple ash trees that were around. We're just going to let it grow. And I'm actually curious to see what, what happens. We do see some of them getting kind of big and then they get attacked. Um, but in terms of what's happening, it's not something we have a good answer to yet. That's my kind of long-winded, rambly answer. So, so. just going to give it a minute or two. See if anybody has any more questions. Okay, so just to inform everybody, um, Chris and Megan's emails have been placed into the chat. So if you would like to ask them any questions after the webinar, feel free to uh, send some questions. Hope we're getting a lot of thank you. This was a great presentation. So thanks for having us. Yeah. Very fun. Okay. So awesome. So if anybody, if nobody has any more questions. I think I'm going to wrap it up. So I'll thank you two very much for presenting today and for sharing all the interesting research and information. Um, so I'd like to also let everybody know that this webinar will be recorded and it will be posted on our website, uh, www.invasivespeciescenter.ca, as well as on the Invasive Species Center's YouTube channel under uh, webinars. Um, and also just a reminder to everyone to please fill out the post webinar survey. Uh, it's really helpful to us and we'd really appreciate your input and your feedback. Um, and also to let you know, we have webinars planned throughout the year. So if you're interested in seeing future webinars, you can uh, check out our website going onto the events page to see when future webinars will be planned. And thank you everybody for attending and thanks again, Chris and Megan for your presentations. And yeah, thank right, you. Have a good one.
Bye. Bye. See ya.